we change narratives in Russia. Um, so how do we talk about climate? Um, sorry, I'm just keep hearing my echo. Things can can be fixed. Okay. Um, so, so the outline of my presentation. First, uh, why do we study the climate community age? So I, I should um, I should tell that um, um, in my presentation I will be talking about the discourse about narratives. Here, yeah, how do we talk about climate? I will mention Russian politics and business and all other aspects, but it is about mostly about the presentation. Yeah, why is it important to talk about climate change and why? How does it affect? our perception of the problem and then our approach to the problem. So I'll give a little brief outline um, Russia um, and different contextual settings and then I'll divide my speech into four uh, sections where I'm going to talk about the political, business, media and public aspects of uh, climate change communication. Um, so talking about climate change. So first of all, I would like to kind of perhaps say the obvious here that why the environment communication is important is because it's um, it tells us uh, about very important relationship between the people, between the audience uh, and um, the nature, the environment. How do we build those relations? How do we negotiate those relations? And of course, climate change being so specific, um, so particular problem, uh, which requires translation, requires um, explanation. So communication becomes ever more so important. Uh, and as um, has been said before, yeah, that we we understand climate change, um, not so much that we can observe it, yeah, but because somebody explained that the symptoms of climate change, their manifestation of the climate change. And lastly, I want to say about the importance of climate change communication is that um, uh, arguably, yeah, if we don't pay enough attention to the discourse, the way we talk about climate, then we can't reach the agreement and we can't come to the solution we can't resolve the problem and of course I'm, I'm sure you're well aware over the decades now that it was one of the most disputed topic uh, in politics and science um, so obviously the communication side of it is very very important here um, so Talking about climate and uh, literature, over the last decade there has been a great body of literature on climate communication. Um, it's, um, the importance of it uh, was emphasized by various researchers and it has been discussed what kind of factors affect uh, our discussions. However, to the date we still, this enormous body of literature is still mostly concentrated in the West about the Western uh, narratives. And of course, there has been great findings in Chipre, and it's very interesting to um, study these um, projects. But we also need to expand the knowledge and we need to look further abroad. Um, again, over the last years, we've seen emerging literature on Russian post Soviet space in general. And in other parts of the world, which were previously kind of abandoned, and there are quite important findings there, and very interesting ones. And what we see is that how, depending on different political structures, histories, cultures, you know, we can see how the blame being allocated, whether it's the national government you know, who gets the blame for climate change, or it's the international community, businesses, or there's no blame allocated at all. 
all depends on how on the country's uh, historical past on, on country uh, resources and economic structure, political structure, uh, some cultural aspects. You will see very different way that the climate has been discussed. So what is important is also tells us about vulnerabilities and how vulnerabilities are presented, who's the vulnerable, yeah, how, how they should be protected the vulnerable part of the society, and also about the power knowledge distribution, who is in charge of uh, the discourse, climate discourse, uh, who is um, controlling it, uh, who kind of dominates the discourse. And at the end, we can see yeah, how problem is approached in the country. And then eventually we can guess or we can find out yeah, and come to the solution. How can it be resolved? Yeah. Russia and climate change. I know that um, quite a few of you come from the geographical background and Eastern European studies. So all of it is very obvious and quite simplistic information. I mentioned it here in my presentation as I think it's, that's what um, these geographical characteristics, they over and over over the years reappear in the discourse on climate change in Russia. So of course Russia being the largest state in the world, uh, but it's not just that, it's not about the size, the size. it's about the diversity, yeah? the various climate zones, various natural zo zones, also variety of the uh, natural resources, it all kind of affects the mentality, the policy, and the economy, as we will see from my presentation. Another extremely important characteristic, geographical characteristic of Russia, which impacts climate change discussion quite often, is that most of the territory in Russia, 65% of it, is covered by permafrost, which is, of course, very vulnerable to uh, climatic changes. So, from the historical point of view, uh, what is important is uh, that we have this quite a substantial um, environmental legacy here from the Soviet time. So, at that time, as we know, there's been very limited concern for environment, um, population health, uh, focus on um, economic development, of course, uh, the country was concentrated on developing heavy industry and agriculture, and there were quite a few you know, environmental sacrifices made along the way. There were major environmental disasters here, for example, Zyral Sea, nuclear pollution, um, the Pilates test, Polygon. This now located geographically in different countries after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but of course the legacy remained there. Um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course we have this, um, the impact of the socio-political and economic change, um, the country trying to figure out its place in the new international um, setting a you know, new economic, political role in the world. And again, this also reappears in the way the country performed during the negotiations um, with regards to the climate change problem. At the same time, early 90s, uh, Russia is um, dealing with a number of various security problems, you know, various conflicts in the country or near the borders. Um, so, which also kind of affected the, the way the politicians, the way the, the leaders of the country approach various issues. So, for, for some time, uh, we could see that throughout all the, these different uh, type of discourses, narratives, there's reappearance of, due to Russia's uh, very specific um, geographical location and all of these characteristics I mentioned before, uh, we have been observing uh, sort of this misperception or this very specific perception of climate change, yeah? quite a positive 
way to interpret the climate change consequences for Russia. Uh, for instance, uh, the opinion, the opinion um, popular that climate change would extend the zone of comfortable living or reduce energy expenses during the heating season, facilitate access to natural resources, of course, had to do a lot with the development of the Arctic Sea and access to the Arctic resources and so on. And now, almost two decades ago, yeah, the infamous uh, quote came from the leader of the country, how um, Russia as a northern country might benefit from um, global warming. Yeah, we could spend less on fur coats and the grain harps would grow up. So, but recently, especially with the help of, help of the Russian climatologist with a very strong you know, scientific body, we see start to realize the real vulnerabilities of the country. And the realization came that actually because of this geographical characteristic, Russia is more vulnerable to climate change than most of the other countries in the world. The climate change is happening faster there. Um, so, and we witnessed uh, some nature disaster events uh, over the last years, and um, this time economists as well started to calculate how much country would lose due to the climatic changes, due to the increased number of the natural disaster events and so on. Those quotes I use here, they come from the um, English language media, but the, the same narrative you could start to see in the Russian uh, media as well. So this more alarmist discourse about the climate change consequences. So switching um, towards my kind of the four dimensions of the discourse that we've been analyzing over the years. So first, talking about the political dimension. Uh, first of all, we need to remember here yeah, that Russia's economy is ha heavily based on exploitation of natural uh, resources. Uh, at the same time, Russia is um, one of the most carbon intensive economies in the world. It is considered either fourth or fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world, depending on how you count European Union. So uh, at the same time, Russia is infamous for its quite rather controversial history of the involvement in a global uh, negotiation process. So, um, and um, especially um, when it was uh, during the Kyoto Protocol, I, I don't want to tell too much about this, maybe during the discussion section we can just talk about it more. Yeah, but it's a uh, long story short that it came down to Russia um, to bring the protocol into force. And it took a few years of negotiations. And um, it's mostly the negotiations were about other political and economic issues, not the climate change per se. So that it was used in order to uh, gain uh, certain benefits. So uh, Russia have been um, accused in um, kind of consistently having very modest commitments to greenhouse gas um, reductions. Um, and also what is um, kind of interesting about the political dimension of the discourse, uh, it's when um, climate change does enter the political discussion, discourse, um, the leaders like to talk about, and other political actors like to talk about um, energy efficiency discourse um, and the discourse of economic modernization. So kind of those win-win scenarios. How can we uh, contribute uh, to cutting emissions and still allow Russian economy to continue to develop? Um, at the national level, so at the international level, even though Russia had this sort of the 
controversial involvement, but we should admit that it has been consistently involved in the international climate regime in one way or another. At the national level, climate like policies were quite slow to evolve, but still quite slow to develop um, and uh, shape up. So, for instance, only in 2009, yeah, the climate doctrine was accepted in Russia, which um, stated that you know, the climate change is one of the most important international problems and it acknowledged its uh, anthropogenic character and acknowledged the importance of this problem uh, for Russia. But it was more, as, again, as a change of the rhetoric. I didn't have any power with that dream. And it took a while then the sort of the more substantial laws uh, were adopted, which were more directly related to the greenhouse gas emissions reduction process. Also, in terms of the political dimension, we keep seeing uh, mixed messages coming from the top. Uh, on one side, um, sometimes there is this uh, kind of positive spin on Russia's involvement in the climate and negotiation process. Um, for instance, um, the fact that the Kyoto Protocol uh, was um, came into force and after uh, Russia um, agreed to um, sign it, ratify it. So they actually, it's presented as uh, Russia being an environmental leader, yeah, kind of leading the discussion. Also, uh, there is a narrative of, the, of Russia being an environmental donor and emphasizing this uh, very uh, drastic uh, reduction of the emissions after the collapse of the Soviet Union and also the um, forest, Russian forest, uh, the, the resources and which are yeah, presented as the, one of the most important tools in order to combat climate change. At the same time, next to this positive uh, discourse, we keep seeing the appearance of these various forms of climate skepticism coming from the very top. Uh, for instance, this is one of the most uh, so recent examples, um, we see uh, the Paris conference uh, five years ago, which was very important for the world. Uh, Russian uh, president made very strong statement, very positive statement um, about Russia's commitment to the climate regime. At the same time, continues to question the anthropogenic character of climate change or the kind of uh, the necessity of the drastic economic measures, political measures in uh, climate change mitigation policies. And for instance, this uh, quote from 2018 uh, uh, by uh, Vladimir Putin says that we are witnessing global warming, but we do not understand the reasons for this warming because there are still no answers. And the so-called anthropogenic emissions most likely are not the main cause of this warming. It may be changes of a global um, nature of his uh, reaction yet yeah, to the youth protest. They say, I may disappoint you, but I don't share the common excitement about the speech by Greta Thunberg. No one has explained to Greta that the modern world is complex and different. And people in Africa or in many Asian countries want to live at the same wealth level as in Sweden. Uh, so it's also interesting how uh, sometimes um, inside the country or at the international um, level, we can see how uh, Russian um, representatives or Russian leaders, they use the, the, the problem, the climate change in, along the, you know, in order to resolve other political issues or in conjunction with other political issues, but at the same time, um, they also accuse the international community in making the uh, problem too public about politics, and they should kind of try to affect, you know, the, the politics not related to climate change. 
And I found this um, quote quite interesting, fascinating, because it was uh, made in relation to the economic sanctions, which have nothing to do with uh, climate change problem, yet the connection with the uh, conflict in eastern Ukraine. Um, but at that time, the uh, climate change advisor, the president, said that um, further implementation of the sanctions policy in regards to a number of countries will call into the question the joint achievements by the countries of the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Yeah? So making this link between the sanctions and the progress um, of the climate change negotiations. So I would like, to, in my research, I always like to look for some kind of positive uh, signs or steps or examples where it did work, yeah, where we're talking about some kind of movement or improvement in the uh, discourse and the discussion of climate change. And you could see uh, how the actual um, evolution of the, the, the discourse is taking place and becomes uh, the discussion becomes a more sophisticated, more knowledgeable, and the number of events of the process is then taking place, which is slowly moving the narrative. So one of this is um, the Climate Week, for instance, here, yeah, which was a national event, obviously coordinated by the um, with the approval of Russian government, coordinated by the uh, President's representative on change president advisor on climate change. So the climate week, uh, which took place in 2017, consisted of the over 400 uh, events throughout the country and various organizations to place in it, business, uh, government, uh, education, and NGOs, and so on, were all kind of even army and military. Uh, so various, various uh, places, various organizations started to talk about climate change, started to do things in the name of the climate change, which I found quite impressive, uh, considering that, you know, just a few years ago, uh, there was basically nothing, no discussion at all happening at the national level. Um, business dimension. So this goes hand in hand with the political discourse. Um, so first of all, yeah, we need to mention the very close links, connections between the state and the energy sector. Um, so again, we're talking here about economic over-reliance on the fossil fuel industry. Um, so the, the major, the, companies in the country. Yeah, we're talking about uh, the, the gas companies, oil companies, yeah, natural resources. So, and of course, they're the ones globally, not just in Russia, who contributed mostly to the problem of climate change. So, and they're the most difficult actors to talk to, to work with, again, internationally, globally, not just in Russia. Um, so, and this is one of the reasons yeah, behind this whole reluctant process of the cl climate mitigation policy. But at the same time, a um, lot well, income comes from the export, from trading abroad. And Russia's big business, they have to adapt to the international uh, context and they need to play by the rules of the importers. Um, for instance, at the moment, yeah, there's a big discussion in terms of the um, EU regulations and um, regulations of the carbon and how it will affect uh, Russian companies. In terms of the discourse, in terms of the narratives, again, uh, if you compare especially to the Western companies, businesses, you will see very little mentioning of the climate change. Um, in public communication, but the uh, businesses which do trade a lot internationally, especially if they have big offices uh, located somewhere in the countries with the proactive climate change policy, then you will see it affects also in this course there, and you will see the appearance of the climate change. 
note in their communication. And again, like with the government, uh, more often we see climate change appearing kind of addressed indirectly within the context of energy efficiency, resource saving measures, you know, in the context of modernization. Again, this sort of win-win scenario. How can we continue uh, uh, develop business and at the same time uh, present ourselves as being um, concerned climate change problem and other environmental problems. Again, somewhat uh, positive sign of the development of the discourse, the business discourse on climate change. You can talk about the climate partnership of Russia, which is again a very interesting initiative of a um, uh, couple of dozen, dozen uh, companies uh, made a joint statement how they support the green economy transition and uh, that was a statement made before the Paris uh, conference and how they uh, acknowledge the importance of the climate change problem and um, would like to support the negotiation process and uh, would like to contribute to the fight against the uh, global climate change. And again, the various um, companies there, there are some um, Western uh, countries located in Russia, but also major Russian giant, you know, business, just like Rusal or Alrosa, Rushidra, and so on. Media dimension. Um, media is um, quite interesting in Russia in terms of uh, the way it talks about uh, climate change. Um, so, first of all, I think um, before we look at the sort of the qualitative uh, characteristics of the climate change discussion, it's important to highlight the quantitative uh, side of it. A few years ago, we conducted the, um, the analysis of the major Russian newspapers um, over a um, long period of time. And the first thing which kind of we realized is that the very, relatively speaking, a very limited uh, discussion, very low volume of the coverage. So if you can see this uh, graph on my slide, the red color, this is um, 23 Russian newspapers uh, with the mention of climate over these years. Uh, the gray, gray um, uh, line, that's just one newspaper, New York Times. Or the black line, it's the five American uh, newspapers combined. So you see the the difference, just the quantitative difference, which tells us about something, yeah, what is going on in the country. Uh, qualitatively, uh, some observations have been made that media discourse follows the official discourse, which is again, Russia is not that unique in this regard. Yeah, for instance, the, you can see that there's the spike with the American press and the Russian press coincides around 2009, for instance, yeah, the Copenhagen conference, which kind of uh, attracted the attention of the media, global media. Um, the difference, another difference uh, with the West and Russian uh, media is that as what we call the limited impact of the paper level characteristics. What do we mean by this is that uh, in, the, in the West, like for instance, the US or the UK, uh, you can predict in, to, certain, to certain extent how the newspaper will be approaching climate change problem depending on where it belongs on the political spectrum, where it's a left-wing newspaper, right-wing newspaper, the center newspaper, it will have different agendas, different type of coverage. In Russia, it doesn't really work that well. So you will see some very minor variations, um, but it's probably the, something has to do with the problem of the political left and right in general in the country. But what does um, 
affect more is the sort of the national level characteristics. For instance, the, the, the health of the economy. When there's um, economic crisis, for instance, then the tension is diverted from the climate problems. And it's only mentioned very briefly, and it's not discussed in, within the context of the Russia's commitments, or what has to be done in order to uh, combat climate change uh, problem. Um, I just um, wanted to use this um, example of the Izvestia um, newspaper, which I, I analyzed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you can, I mean, it's just one of the newspapers uh, in Russia, and it's not quite representative of all the other um, traditional media outlets. But I thought it was an interesting case uh, because it's a well-established newspaper. Uh, so we were able to access the coverage uh, for, for a few decades. Um, so we could see how the discourse has changed over the years. And what was very interesting is that in early 90s, when the country was going through the economic and political collapse, there was very, very limited coverage as expected. And in the world, it was, you know, media did not pay as much attention at the time to climate change um, anyway. But uh, the articles which did appear, they were very strongly in favor of the climate change mitigation policy. They were confirming the anthropogenic character of climate change. Um, they had a very strong uh, message. Um, so, and throughout the 90s and early 2000s, the skeptical themes were practically absent from the discourse. Um, but towards the end, of this uh, the study period in 2009-2012, uh, one third of the coverage is questioning the anthropogenic nature of climate change. So whilst the science becomes more and more certain, uh, this particular media outlet, outlet becomes less certain, you're more skeptical in approaching this uh, problem. So, but should note that over the whole period, majority of the country of the articles did not allocate blame at all. We didn't basically discuss the nature of climate change, mentioned it as a problem, but did not say why is it happening, um, whether it's anthropogenic or not. Also, if you sort of uh, note some of the media dimension of the climate change discourse in the country. We do need to look more into the regional variations. Again, big country, very diverse country. Uh, the newspapers, the coverage in, in Moscow would be quite different to the uh, coverage somewhere else. There have been a couple of studies done so far about the regional media coverage, which does show that actually depending on where the region is located, depending on uh, the state of the science or the how much uh, the region is exposed to the international uh, community and so on. The, the coverage also changes the um, discourse, the climate discourse changes. In terms of the social media, internet, that's another interesting uh, area uh, of study. So like everywhere else, we can see this effect of echo chambers in Russia. Yes, so people who convinced that problem is uh, not real, it's fictional, they talk to the same, uh, same audience, audience who uh, shares their news, and the people who are activists, who are proactive, who are trying to uh, get engaged with this problem um, and strongly supporting climate change mitigation policy, yeah, they also talk with like-minded like uh, people. But what is interesting, of course, on the internet is whilst it does give the platform for activists um, to share their site, but it also um, gives platform to the to people um, to start reintroducing this sort of the Cold War rhetoric and spread of the conspiracy theories and so on. So talking about climate changes in context of climate battles, climate weapons, um, and that this plot created by the West. Uh, 
in order to uh, destroy Russia or uh, yeah, do something uh, to the country. So this quote, uh, quite interesting from one of the blogs um, I analyzed, and it was talking about um, climate change uh, protest, uh, climate change march, and appealing to people not to join it because it's not actually what it is. Public discourse is the last um, dimension I will discuss. Um, so various uh, opinion polls uh, show in the country uh, that there is a slight, some increase going on in terms of the public concern over the climate change problems, but still, relatively speaking, comparing to other countries, uh, we're talking about quite a low level of awareness of climate change problems. And what is interesting, Russia is lagging behind even the developing economies. So the whole this argument that we will first need to address our social or economic problems and then we'll think about environment here doesn't quite work this way. Uh, so for instance, uh, here I present them um, one of the latest um, uh, opinion polls conducted earlier this year, just when the uh, sort of pandemic started to unfold. Um, and you can see, um, you can access the whole, I provided the link for the whole um, study, but you could see that Russia, when it comes to the, for instance, um, opinion on whether the humans uh, affect climate change or the reason for the climate change, Russia comes second to last. Yeah. So, and, and the question, when people will ask what are the three top problems, uh, environmental problems um, in the world, again, Russia is, uh, has kind of the fewest people who put climate change as the top priority problem. Uh, the problems they did prioritize, the deforestation and emissions, which I think that was more to do with the air quality rather than uh, emissions contributing to the climate change. And um, just a few more slides from the studies, which I find quite interesting, is that when people were asked about the climate change and the political support, so would they, uh, do they think that the government should uh, prioritize the problem or otherwise they will be failing people? Or do they think if political policy party doesn't uh, take the climate change seriously, you're not going to be voting for them? Russia is, comes last. Yes, yeah, so uh, there is no pressure on the political actors to take climate change more seriously. And these results come from the survey, uh, which uh, actually uh, in Russian case, they asked, um, the disclosure says that they uh, surveyed more urban educated uh, people with high incomes. So they're not even representative of the whole country. And traditionally, it suggested that people with a high level of education or li living in urban areas, they will have more concern for climate change. Uh, so, and they will have more access to the climate change information. So, um, a few more words about the public discourse. This, uh, the people continue to prioritize their socioeconomic uh, problems. Um, and there still we have this sort of the evidence of the um, discussion of climate change in a positive way as a beneficial uh, for Russia. Um, at the same time, when we talk about the public discourse, we can't isolate climate change from the other issues going on in the country in the sense that there are, as we know, there are overall the, quite a substantial restrictions on the civil society engagement, which of course affects the way people uh, kind of express their opinion on the climate change issues. For instance, Russia was not able as much to join the global movement, yet the global recent youth mo movement in Fridays for Future, but still uh, people were trying to find the way um, 
to communicate uh, their opinion on it. And there were some examples here, not a good examples, uh, where the students, uh, the young people were protesting, even just using the option of the single person you pick at and protesting, and they still were expressing their opinion on climate change and their concern and their worry about the problem. Um, in conclusion, I just would like to um, say that, as I said at the beginning, that with climate change, we have to consider socioeconomic, political, geographical context, and because it all, as we can see, affects the way we talk about the problem, the way we perceive the problem. In Russia, we've seen numerous restrictions, numerous step, steps back, but at the same, we cannot ignore the conversation is evolving and it's involving more actors. And it, the, the level of awareness, even though low compared to other countries, but it keeps increasing. Uh, so now the more important question now is what can we do in order to continue this qualitative change in national discourse? And how can it translate into more practical outcomes? And also how the global community can find better ways to talk to Russia about climate change. And this means to achieve uh, certain agreements and more tangible you know, outcomes of the negotiation process. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Mariana, for your very interesting presentation. Now I invite everyone to, uh, to ask their questions in the chat. We will then bundle them and give them to Mariana. Um, I actually, I, I found so many, uh, I have so many follow-up questions. I'm, I'm trying to sort of group them in my head and look where I would like to start. Something that I found really interesting is this the, the graphics you posted about the importance of climate change for uh, in relation to other populations in other countries around the world. And as you showed, um, Russians care a lot about deforestation, see that as a, as a big problem. They care a lot about air quality, which is a big problem. And I think this is also linked to probably economic problems like the big fires in the recent years. So crisis, which have really made them sort of aware. But the perception of climate change is is like completely um, disconnected from this. It's like a, a like a separate problem, and of course, this has something to do, I think, with what you described, with not um, pointing out strongly the anthropogenic nation of climate change, but really sort of looking at it as a phenomenon which just comes from somewhere. Um, is this point? Um, or how should I put it differently? Um, how much does also climb education about um, climate change, education about environmental change, and education about um, the connections between different aspects of environmental change? How much is that present in, let's say, education in primary school, secondary school? Is that something that has has already started? Is that part of the curriculum or is it something that has been more made by groups outside of the regular school system? Uh, well, as far as I'm aware, that now there have been some uh, discussion going on of how to introduce the climate change uh, in the education system, yeah, the, especially talking about the schools. But um, which is, again, which is one of those kind of uh, how, last how full situation, yeah, the positive process. And I've been uh, talking to people who are kind of pushing this agenda and who are developing um, their kind of addition to the curriculum, how do we talk about environment this way, how to introduce climate. But of course, when we have to see that generational change, yeah, that we have uh, kind of a big proportion of the population uh, where this uh, the climate change issues were not 
discuss or introduce in the educational system if you're not, of course, studying the university a certain uh, degree. So I think this is something quite new and is not quite spread yet, not quite established yet in the country. But again, it's kind of one of these initiatives which uh, hopefully we will see more developed over the years. Um, but this the whole process, like some of the things uh, um, you have mentioned, that it's interesting how there's no connection yet between uh, concern for certain environmental problems and not linking to the climate change. Uh, this, this is very interesting, and I've been just uh, looking into them, a couple of articles uh, written by one of our uh, colleagues who looked at the perception of climate change in the Russian north. And as you know, the people, why Russia is so much vulnerable to climate change? Because it's a northern country, yeah, that the countries who are close to Arctic or who, uh, the countries who have Arctic as part of them, uh, they are the most vulnerable because the fragility of the Arctic system to the climatic changes. So and the people, of course, the, uh, who live in this condition, they are the, the ones who will be observing it or are already observing the changes and who are directly affected by the climatic changes. But that research study I'm referring to is actually shows how people, yes, indeed, they see how uh, their life already is the quality of life already going down because of their access, I don't know, to food or there are just some logistical issues here yeah, being affected by the changes in the seasons, the changes in the weather patterns and so on. But they still refusing to make connections, uh, links with the anthropogenic uh, climate change. Um, it's partly something to do with the perceiving environment as being something so grand and out of our hands, uh, which is just, you know, arrogant for us to say that we are able to change the environment. So this is some kind of cultural perception of it. But also, at the say, on the other side of it, we have this kind of Soviet legacy impact of how the technology, how the progress can result that we created the problem, we can fix it. Yes, yeah, so the, the man is, so it's a completely different approach. So we actually, the man is the master yeah, in the universe, very anthropogenic kind of upon-centric uh, approach to the problem. So we, we can carry on living as we like, but we just invest more in technology and then we'll solve this problem. And another kind of strand saying that uh, the, the group uh, saying, okay, we actually, even in our generation, we already witnessed so many political changes, economic changes. We went through so many crises and we dealt with so many problems. It will be just another problem and we will, you know, survive, we'll deal with it. So I think, it, yeah, it, it's very interesting. And it's, um, I don't think there is one simplistic explanation of why this link is not made. Yeah, I find it quite fascinating. If if you have political leaders who send mis mixed messages, right, then it's very easy as the population or or just a single individual person to just choose whichever side you're on, you know, because at one point political leaders um, pay, acknowledge that climate change is a serious problem, but at the same time, as you showed very clearly, they sort of undermine their own mm -hmm. message. And I was yeah. wondering whether there is sort of a, a role assignment within official communications in Russia. You know, that some actors or some states, institutions sort of play the more climate um, friendly cop and the others play sort of the more economy efficiency cop. Well, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, even if we talk about the top level, uh, the previous, um, like the only one, Another president with Russia had, uh, he was more, maybe it was more pro, for instance, in his discourse at least, uh, played this kind of good cop. And he was about, uh, you know, he, it, during his presidency that um, the climate doctrine, for instance, was uh, uh, developed. 
And he was talking all about this kind of green economy, green development, and making these big statements. And after that, uh, we saw more sort of switch, sort of back and forth. Um, among other institutions, there is definitely um, divisions depending on what their interests are. And of course, we have very strong, I should mention that in Russia, we also have a very strong scientific uh, community. And, and Russia is actually a former Soviet Union, had um, made a tremendous contribution in the development climate knowledge and climate science. And this is a, another kind of controversy uh, because, yeah, this kind of the top notch scientific development come from the country, but at the same time, it doesn't correlate with the national discourse of the national policies because, of course, different agendas there. And even within uh, business communities, yeah, even within the com businesses uh, who depend on the fossil fuel exploration, we have different kind of approaches and some of them kind of present this uh, more kind of European is you would like a way of dealing with the problem and trying to find the ways uh, to present climate change as uh, something which is important but is manageable and something they're willing to work on. And then there are companies which just say, no, it's all rubbish. It's just a conspiracy theory and it's just going to damage country and uh, there's no point even engaging with it. So there are, yeah, there's different, definitely uh, various narratives. And that's why I think it's important kind of uh, not put Russia in just one, this uh, category and say it's only like that. It's a country, I don't know, climate skeptic and it's only looks at the climate change in a certain way. Um, I think it's important to look what's going on inside there and kind of the variation of discourses. And of course, uh, again, Russia is not unique in this regard. Look at the United States. Yeah, we have change of the leadership, the discourse changing and confuses people. Yeah, the, the people following kind of this narrative. And now hopefully U.S. changing back again. So we'll see how that will unfold. Yeah. Questions? I think I saw a sign or something. I, um, thanks also from my side for, for your interesting presentation, Mariana. I have a question. You mentioned the um, this image of an uh, environmental donor, like like the Russian Federation as an as an uh, environmental donor, a donor um, international scale. You know, this figure of this of the environmental donor can, but doesn't have to be connected to a strong climate change or, or environmental crisis discourse, right? But but one um, one of the framings in which I know it is that you that you have. Uh, the picture of the environmental donor as an implicit or explicit answer to, to a narrative of um, environmental crisis. So I was wondering, in the, in the instances in which you see this figure mobilized, can you, do you see a pattern that, that it is a way of acknowledging a environmental crisis and acknowledging um, climate change? And at the same time, giving it a twist and saying, "Well, yeah, there is a problem, but but this is the this is the, the side of it where uh, Russia plays a positive role or, or can use it as a as a benefit in some sense." Sorry, um, sorry. So you talk about like can Russia uh, benefit from? No, not Russia. No, on, on, at, the, at the discursive level, like, mm -hmm. do you do you see a strong coupling between the figure of the environmental donor being mobilized to the discourse of, of climate change? And do you see a kind of tactical relationship between these two? Like, but that's what they do. In, oh, sorry. Yeah, they actively do in this. Whenever you go uh, look at uh, Russia's um, engagement or Russia's presentation at any uh, climate negotiation, 
it always comes from this point of view of being environmental donor, environmental leader. And there is this whole big other, I'll show you where discussion of Russia being the great power, you know, and constantly reinventing itself, yeah, great power in something, yeah, great power, you're talking about its energy power or its political power. So now we're bringing this the same discourse. It's like you, you either stand this strong and, you know, hold your uh, head high, yeah, or you don't enter the discussion at all. So when Russia goes into the climate change, it's always this, look at our forest, look at our emission drop of, you know, 90s. So, and then it starts the discussion. So in this sense, it's, it's constantly, yeah, this idea keeps reappearing over and over again in the political discourse. And if you look at this, um, for instance, the very kind of positive statement made during the Paris conference by Vladimir Putin. Again, it was from this kind of strong point position that Russia is not an outsider. Uh, Russia is not a, you know, the, the, this kind of villain of the climate mitigation process. No, it's environmental donor and it's a environment. And my personal point of view, okay, if it's, you know, if it's how they want to start this conversation, at least it's, it's, it's the beginning, you know, at least it allows Russia to enter the conversation rather than constantly acting on the defense, yeah, we're just not going to do anything. We're not going to even engage with the process. So if it allows the sort of more constructive dialogue, then maybe it is the way to frame it. So there are problems with it, but I also think there are quite beneficial size to this framing. Okay, thank you. There are two more questions from the chat, but I'll ask, just bundle them because they're, I think they're related. Uh, one question is whether you think that there will be in the future a change in how we, there is, how, how the talk about climate change in Russia goes. And the other question, uh, thanks you for the presentation, and then asks uh, whether you could propose some more promising strategies for a more cl successful climate change. Uh, change discourse in Russian media and civil society? Um, so, is there going to be a change? I think there is, the change is already happening, and unfortunately, it's not our choice. And, you, and our, by our, I mean not just Russia, like in the world, you know, we just, the fact is, we cannot ignore climate change anymore and climate change becomes more and more evident, and in Russia as well. So Russia had major floods over the just the last few years, had major fires. So it has, it's been affected by the climate change. And that means that the discourse, I think, will just get become more and more elaborate. And there will have to answer some questions and connect the dots. Yeah, at, at the moment, it doesn't always work. But I'm sure the more of these things are happening, unfortunately, they will have to start suggest a more um, sort of sophisticated, yeah, more uh, realistic explanation why is it happening. Uh, so, and in terms of the kind of uh, strategies for more successful climate change discourse, of course, it depends what do you mean by the successful um, discourse. If we're talking about like increasing the level of awareness or having a more sophisticated discussion, yeah. So uh, the most simplistic strategy is, of course, uh, state being more vocal, yeah. That the state still depend, regardless um, all other actors, state is the main newsmaker on any subject and including climate change as well. So if we see the strong change there, uh, the, the carry, you know, the, the change keeps happening, then we will see the change happening in the media and then civil society will be allowed to react. Yeah, if it doesn't go against the state policy, then people are not going to be arrested by, uh, for trying to speak out, for trying to talk, of, you know, take part in the Fridays for future. Uh, then. So this is sort of more uh, kind of pragmatic approach. Um, for the 
civil society, for the NGOs, for the other actors trying to uh, affect the discourse, they need to find the ways if they uh, if they can't do this sort of in the confrontational way, but you can't always support it. You can try to fight it, yeah, but uh, and that might bring some benefits to it. Uh, like it's very, I think. Um, Impressive what these young people are doing here. Yeah, they can keep taking in these protests and piquetting and keep going and talking about climate change to the streets and uh, being, you know, arrested even and then going back to the streets. Uh, so this is one way. Also, another way is trying to find those uh, compromises and win-win scenarios, which again, NGO, Russian NGOs have been doing for years and keep keep doing. Um, I'm not inventing the wheel here yet. It's, it's not something completely. It's people keep trying to work on the problem and find the ways how they can talk uh, to the state, how they can talk to the business. What are the kind of common grounds? For instance, this whole dialogue of energy efficiency. Okay, that's not a radical modernization of the economy, but at least it's something is quite a substantial progress if Russia does modernize its energy sector, if it does uh, take seriously, you know, the energy efficiency policy, it will cut the emissions quite substantially. Or if it will look, start diversifying its economy, it can benefit, you know, from it, uh, make it stronger, but at the same time, start cutting those emissions as well. So there are kind of different ways how we can uh, change the discourse of how can we help it to develop further. Okay. More questions? I was wondering in the data that you showed on the media media coverage, I understood that these that these studies um, uh, the systematic studies reach until 2012, 2000 14. Now there has been, in, if, if you look at many other countries internationally, there has been a sharp rise in the media interest in, in public change issues and also the examples which you presented for uh, the Russian Federation, such as a climate week in 2017. This was mm -hmm. also after, after this period. Yeah. So do you think that, that this um, resonates with with, with a rise in, in, in the media coverage too, was a, such a, a, a strong rise in the Russian media, which, which you don't have represented in the, in the time frames of, of the studies you cited? Well, um, so um, I should mention two things. So first of all, yeah, um, I haven't conducted the comprehensive study uh, in the last maybe three, years or so uh, for uh, looking at the Russian traditional uh, media, but I did, I, I keep monitoring and, and looking at the coverage. Um, so the, there was, at some point, um, how would I say it? At the same time, uh, we see kind of, kind, yes, like you say, the globally, the attention, uh, there was spikes and this global protest and uh, so on, but in Russia, we have uh, Eastern Ukraine, here yeah, we have uh, sanctions. Uh, so in the last few years, which kind of went against this uh, interest. So it's it, a little bit difficult to assess uh, the actual, uh, the real uh, spike in the media coverage if it was not affected by those uh, very, very uh, serious uh, political and economic problems in the country, as you know, Russia went into the quite substantial recession and so on. Yet yeah, there were quite a few things and the media uh, discourse quite was bombarded by certain messages. Uh, so yes, you have this kind of spike of the interest, but then you have the contrast spike of the different issues. So this is just based on my kind of more anecdotal evidence rather than the systematic ones. So that's what I observed over the last few years there. Yeah, I find this uh, 
this confluence with the international situation is so interesting because at the beginning you mentioned, you know, there are conflicts in and at the borders of Russia. And I was wondering where you would go there, how this would sort of influence how is how there is talk about climate change. But you showed it very clearly, I think, that sort of the international position of Russia's government or where it wants to position itself, what role it wants to play in an international setting, also in international organizations, is a big deal in how it, how there how the talk about climate change in Russia is developing. I think we saw it also in the newspaper study that these international summits um, generated much, much less interest in Russian newspapers than they did in international newspapers. And, I, and then also in the social media discourse about climate change being just an invention of, you know, Europeans uh, or the European left-wing discourse and so on. So is it necessary to sort of reinvent climate change as a Russian problem to really sort of get the impetus going to, you know, to to push it strong, push it more strongly to the foreground in public discourse, to sort of take it out of that. It's an international problem, and we need to play along to the, make it sort of a national priority and national thing. Um, well, yes and no. I think uh, yes, we're all in it together. Yeah, like uh, it is an international problem, and all the people. Um, yeah, I mean, just media-wise. <laughs> yeah. So, but I think we have. I personally think we do have to we do have to reinvent the problem. Not just Russia, we have to go, um, but we have to look at different countries. You know, we have to respect these variations and the different approaches and how the countries being affected. So I think we do have to look into uh, Russia, India, China. You know, I don't know Qatar, US. We have to look at the variations of those discourses and respect that people have a different level of vulnerabilities, different level of exposure. They have different historical perceptions, um, different cultural perceptions. Otherwise, I think, I mean, it would be good if we have found this universal solution and we just talked it as a, this one global international problem and just everyone just jumped in and, and you know, took part in this discussion. But I just don't think it's realistic. We're going to just carry on hitting the wall because we don't speak the same language as, you know, using the stereotype. Uh, like it's been happening with the problem we're all living in right now, you know, the, the, the pandemic is quite a similar situation. So we're all in it, we all experience to think in the same way, but people react differently and people live through it in a different way. And, you know, it's kind of different reality. That's why I think I kind of I think it should be sort of a healthy combination probably of this meeting this international discourse and recognizing the nature of this problem, but at the same time respecting the national perception uh, of the problem and trying to find uh, understanding of how to how people perceive or approach it. Thank you. Are there any more questions? If so, that would be the, your last chance to post them in the chat. Or do you have any more questions, Alexander? Like one, one point that um, you mentioned again back to the climate week you mentioned the the state and government involvement in organizing this so i was um, also observing more of the state directed um, initiatives from from the russian government in the environment in the broader um, field of environmental politics i was wondering if if the, there was an extension to this initiative beyond this week or, or if, if there's a broader pattern of of such um, initiatives from the state side to um, to to shape the politics and or, or this part of, or this level mm -hmm. of the politics and discourse of, of um, climate change well um, so in um, during I think uh, the Medvedev's uh, 
presidency, uh, I think it was during his time as well, they created this post of the climate um, change advisor to the president. Uh, and why am I mentioning this? That it was that this climate week was actually uh, uh, overseen and supervised here, yeah, but by this person, his office, yeah, of the climate uh, change presidential advisor. And this post now exists, you know, that's the permanent position. And it's a new person who occupies this uh, post now, but he's still quite reactive. Before it was a climatologist, a scientist, now it's more the politician. Um, kind of person. Um, so, and I think this was kind of, again another very important step discursively because, um, regardless of those messages going back and forth, uh, we have these uh, at least institutions now established which have to talk about and have to come up with this kind of events or meetings or in you know, organizations. And that's what they do. Uh, they have now. Um, I think what well, they call it the committee or something. Sorry, just the name escaped my head on climate change, which works with, for instance, with business. Yeah, they have regular meetings on the climate change. Uh, so this, some extent, again, yeah, maybe it's limited compared to other countries. I mean, it is limited compared, for instance, even to the you know United Kingdom, let's say. Uh, but at least there is something which is there and it remains. They're talking about climate change. I see there is a very long um, question appeared, and um, um, I'll try to. Maybe you can quickly push. read it so everybody can. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to quickly. <laughs> so, how about the local level? Are there any political forces present in the Russian regions, parliament, which effectively connect environmental problems to the reality of time? Uh, as far as I'm aware, but I might be wrong here because there are, um, you need to really look into the different, you know, there are quite a few as you were in regions in Russia. Uh, the simple answer would be no, but again, I just been monitoring some news and there were meetings, at least at the regional levels, uh, happening where they were discussing the climate change to some extent. I think I don't want to kind of yeah, I don't want to misinform you, but just the short answer would be there is nothing um, kind of at an institutional level established, but there are probably some initiatives, and it's probably more likely in the uh, western uh, northern part of Russia uh, rather than the other regions. Uh, but this is something which is. Again, probably I have to look into more uh, various variations there. Okay. Sorry, it was not probably a very good answer. Yes, but I think it's it's a good point for us to um, remind everybody here that in two weeks from now we will have a roundtable on environmental politics and also environment with environmental activists, journalists, and project leaders, and where we I think can go into a bit more depth in this question oh, also on the the question of you now how how is this all playing out in the regions will certainly be something that we are interested in as well. Yeah, I looked actually at your program, the excellent speakers, and you definitely can ask them also these questions as well, <laughs> because they, I think they would have also some knowledge from the you know, ground and kind of maybe get up to date. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So, but at this moment, thank you so much, Mariana, again, for this presentation, which I found so interesting and which is really prepared as well for next week. Um, thanks for having taken the time for us, uh, despite having so many, so many other obligations. And thanks to everybody who was here, who listened to uh, their questions. <laughs> thanks to kids having patience. <laughs> And a very good evening to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye to everyone. Thank you.